welcome once again to the platform, Professor Ehosa. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me begin on the note of congratulating our country, Nigeria at 62. That's a great, great achievement. Let me also congratulate the platform at 15, and this is the 32nd edition. The platform has become a veritable instrument for reminiscing on things and for reviewing our national standing and coming to new foundations and new beginnings. And I think that today's event falls in line with that mandate that the platform set for itself so long ago. Now today we are saying a better Nigeria is possible. A better Nigeria is possible, what are the whys, what are the what's, and what are the hows? Now, of course, you know, there has to be some structure to our presentation today. When you say something better is possible, you are being normative. To be normative is to talk about what ought to be um, and a little less on what is the situation. But everyone knows that the logic of that presentation would mean that you first have to know what is before you can move on to what ought to be. If you don't know what is, and therefore what is not exactly satisfactory, you cannot identify the things that would make a satisfactory future possible. And so the first thing to say is that even though this is normative, it is very positivist, meaning that we are moving from where we are, which is not so, so good, not so desirable to where we ought to be, which is the desirable point. You know, so join me in this journey of moving from where we are to where we ought to be. The second thing is that this is a possibility, and possibilities are driven by key levers and platforms, including this one. And what that means is that we have to address you know, issues that will take us out of where we are and take us steadily to where we want to be with great confidence. And I want to suggest to us today that what we are doing would involve a reconceptualization of the country that we are in, meaning that we have to have new narratives and counter narratives, if you like. We have to have a reimagined Nigeria. We have to have a new dream. We have to have a new future a more assured future, but a better future that all of us can be part of. What will the levers be? The first, of course, is the counter-narrative itself. The second is the action set, which is yourselves. I'm happy all the time when I see young people gathered looking with expectation to the kinds of things that would make our country better. I assure you that today would be that day that you've had this pact with Nigeria. I'm particularly excited because since coming into this place, I've heard people say to each other, happy independence. It's been such a long time that people said to themselves, happy independence. It, it means that there's a new dawn in our country. There's a new realization and, and, and people, you know, are rearing to go. Now it's in line with that lever that I also say that leadership becomes an essential, essential driver of the new Nigeria that we are thinking about. But let me do my presentation on the basis of three real life stories. The first is a long time ago, I had an occasion to meet, you know, an important global citizen who asked me a very critical question. He said to me, you're a Nigerian. He was not a Nigerian. I said, yes, thank God I'm a Nigerian. And he said, I have one very important question for you. And I said, go ahead. He says, have you come across any Nigerian, small, big, male, female, young, old, who has the interest of the country at heart? What a question. So, I said, he says, no, 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 I don't want you to answer the question now. Go reflect on it and get back to me. So later, he re-engaged me and he said to me, 
Let me tell you why I'm asking the question. I've been in Nigeria not for so long, and every place I have been, I've come across people who are ready to sell the country. Not one person seems to have the interest of this country at heart. Everyone is ready to make a profit, either on the basis of that belongingness. So in other words, being a Nigerian has become a commodity. And the commodity that you exchange for the several things that you want to do. Now I want to suggest to us that we need to counter that narrative. We need to remind ourselves that we are not bound together only by what we can get from our country. We cannot instrumentalize our membership of this country and insist only that we can be good Nigerians only when we have something to get from the country. We have to counter that narrative by saying we have to come by common good, a common good that makes all of us contributors to the common good. Second story. attend an event with, an event of this nature. And I was sitting with him on the, what you call the high table. And I looked around and I saw certain faces, people who were extremely unhappy. And I said to him, Your Excellency, looks like the people are not happy with you. He said to me, well, what do they want me to do? And I said to him, well, what does that mean? He says, but you have been around town. You have seen the, the, the monumental changes in our city. The, the city has become very modern. And, 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 you know, this is the whole thing that we're doing. What do they want? And I said to him, have you asked them, you know, what they want? Then he made the very profoundest of statements. We know what they want. And that's why we stood for election. We must direct them. He reminded me of the political philosopher who had said, if people don't know that freedom is in their interest, you force them to be free. So was this a philosopher king wanting to force people to be free without consulting them, without even finding out who they are? How more contemptuous can we be of those that we lead? if we are saying what do they want without asking them. Now, the third point is the story of a drunkard. Now, I'm sure that when you say that, it's time to lighten the mood. You know, drunkards also give us comic relief, don't they? So, this one drunkard had spent the whole night drinking, and then Stumbling on his way back home the following morning, he lost money. And he kept groping in the dark, looking someplace, until he decided to go someplace where there was light. And his friend came to him to say, what, what might the problem be? He says, he lost his money. And he says, you lost your money? He says, yes. Where did you lose your money? He says, that side. That side. He says, yes. So why are you searching for the money here? He says, there's no light that side. <laughs> the light is here. So this is what leadership represents. You know, that people can see light, you know, as they perceive of their leaders. And the leaders talk to them. And the leaders ask them, what do you, do? What do you want? And the people can have some kind of contract, a soul-to-soul -soul contract with their leaders. Let me start with the first narrative of who we are and how our greatest problem comes from the fractured foundation of our country. The fact that we have found it difficult to arrive at a common good for all of us. That what is good for me is good for everyone. And therefore, that is something we must all defend and protect. If we fail to do so, we haven't found the true sense and essences of our lives. Let me suggest to you, to you, you know, that those who say our country is this deeply divided haven't bothered to look at the history of our country. A long time ago, Professor Billy Dudley, a blessed memory, 
was confronted with the question, if the British didn't come to create Nigeria, would a country like Nigeria have come into being? Now you think of it for one minute. And I want to emphasize why history <clears throat> is the anchor of our new beginning. Now, Professor Billy Dudley says, let us suppose that all the groups in Nigeria would be represented by the letters A, B, C, and D to Z. And he says, there is a gap, there's a distance between A and B. You cannot be A and be B at the same time, isn't it? So there is a sense of mutual exclusivity. But he says, between A and B, and between B and C, and C and D, and so on, there is an N. No, which is a connection between A and B. So you, you find the N and N and N and N until you get to Y and N and Z. You, you, you get it. So he says there are those connections that are not immediately obvious. They are historical. And, you know, at the time Billy Dudley wrote in 1972, um, you know, we had just come out of, of a civil war and people were still trying to reenact, you know, a common front. But today, it makes a lot of sense. All of us who are gathered here, young people mostly, I am sure if you think deep, you will know that all of us have claimed migration to where we now claim to be our places of origin. The truth is, if we were to write the history of those migrations, we would find that we are not who we think we are. We are very different people. And therefore, we cannot continue to insist that who we are presently would define ourselves forever. They never defined us before, they would not define us now, they would not define us tomorrow. It's a situation of fluidity and of constructions and reconstructions. This is one phase of our reconstruction, it is not the end. And therefore those who think that we can only solve our problems once and for all when we do these things today, forget that tomorrow we'll reconstruct ourselves and then we will need new formulas. Professor Thomas Hoskin had said in 1959 that everyone knows that the idea of being a Nigerian is new, but the idea of being Yoruba, of Igbo, of being Efik, of being a Do, and so on, is not much older. All of these identities have taken their forms within the context of a Nigerian state. All of us who say we are children of X, Y, Z, we have been reconstructed within Nigeria. So in other words, Billy Dudley had a counterfactual. If Nigeria didn't exist, according to the British acts of creation, we probably would have had something approximating that. But let's fast forward. Today, nearly a quarter of Nigeria's citizens have inter-ethnic origins. Think of it. Most of us have Yoruba father, Igbo mother, Hausa father, Hausa mother. We don't make you know, so much of this sense. But that's where we are from. We are all connected in ways that are unbelievable. Now, everywhere I've been to in Nigeria, I find that the so-called sons and daughters of the soil, the so-called core people of those territories, have to cohabit with people that they will regard as not part of us, but they know that without them, they cannot do anything. So we are all so connected. And I know that Nigeria has moved. I'll give you an empirical example. In the 1970s and the 1980s, we had football clubs that represented their ethnic differences. Enugu Rangers, Shooting Stars, Stationery Stores, Bendel Insurance, Braca Rovers, all of them. In those days, part of the qualification you needed to have to play for Enugu Rangers was to be Igbo. If you were going to play for shooting stars, we would get you as Yoruba from any part of the world. You had to come to Ibadan to play for shooting stars. But today, most of the players in Eimba are Yoruba and Hausa. <laughs> today, the coaches of Katsina United are Igbos. The players that you find in shooting stars are more Igbo and Edo than Yoruba. It's a big plus for Nigeria. 
It, it means that finally, the ends that were between the A's and the B's are tying up. This is the reality of our country. We are not as divided as we always thought we were. Okay? The second thing is we are a people who have a very special political economy because of how we see ourselves. We see ourselves as people who are driven only by opportunities and crass opportunism. People who don't condemn corruption because it is wrong, but because we don't have the opportunity to get what those people in corrupt places are getting. What is that political economy? It is one that instrumentalizes your citizenship and says to you, you can only be Nigerian only in terms of what you get, so we'll continue to insist on what you get. And this what you get is at the individual level, it's at the level of the group, it's at the level of the community, it's at the level of all that we do. So if we are not in it, we feel there's no guarantee that we would ever get anything. There is a tradition, a culture of entitlement. We have to get out of that. Now what makes that worse, unfortunately, is that because it takes our attention away from the key things we should be doing, we haven't looked at our productivity and our production center, we are very consumerist. And our consumption is the worst possible because we only consume the things we do not produce. Think how we wake every morning and talk about the things that are happening in our country only because the dollar, the naira has fallen. Don't you see it? Even young people who have no business with the U.S. dollar. They know every morning that there's a problem in the country. How do you know? Ah, they say the dollar is now 700. Now, for a people who have the kind of consciousness that we need to reenact, that cannot be our driver. We have to come back and somebody says it is the time to stabilize our country. And these are the lines that we must begin to pursue. Now, when we have a productive economy, when people begin to look to what we can do as a people, to liberate ourselves so that we can live up to the expectation that the world has always made for us, even before independence, then we are marching on to a better Nigeria, a greater Nigeria. Because in today's world, unfortunately, no country acts in isolation, and no country acts alone. But everyone knows that the internal dynamics that drive our country would be the kind of equilibrium that we're able to create between our demands on the state and the supports that we give to the state. Where your demands exceed your supports, the state would be in perennial crisis. We must give to the state the support that the state needs. Loyalty, patriotism. Now these key things that tell us that things can get very bad, but we ourselves are those who would redeem our country. Today we talk about the diaspora community. It is very good, it's one of our greatest strengths. In a globalized world, you need such external branches of your citizenry to be able to drive things. But the diaspora cannot take the place of the non-diaspora. The Omonile is the, is the original foundation, and this is where it is. Because we must not forget the push and pull effects that drive people into diaspora communities. It is because our country has not been able to make the most effective use of the globalization opportunities that have come our way that we have on bridled migrations, brain drain. And in terms of opportunity cost, the country is worse for it because the capacities to even do things internally are waning. Today, we are assailed by forces of globalization 
that are threatening the very foundations of our country, whether it is terrorism, whether it is drug, whether it is human trafficking, whatever it is. And people are saying we're not in a situation where we are able to resist these things and properly respond to them. Why? Because you have heard it said there are frameworks that suggest that there are fragile states. There are states that have failed and that our country is creeping into those kinds of frameworks. But I'd like to suggest to you that states do not fail. When states have failed, they cease to exist. You can talk about state fragility, it can go on. We are fragile, but we will reenact ourselves. We will find our feet again. And it is by going back to history, by going back to the things that make us who we are, the things that strengthen us and give us what the world has always known about the Nigerian energy. Young people today talk about energy. I like energy because energy gives form, it activates, it mobilizes, and most of all, it helps in the process of consolidating. Let me move to the drunkard very quickly. So this drunkard has seen all of the things that we have had to talk about. And then he sees light and he comes to light, even though what he lost is in the dark spot. We see light. Would our leaders come to us again and say, we don't know what you want? It's no longer likely because today there's a new consciousness. There's a new reimagination of our country. The young people are saying we can in several ways. Only yesterday we were having a symposium on the digital economy. And I'm saying countries today are challenged to see how they can become better using the digital economy. But the digital economy itself comes with very serious challenges for the existing nation states. Because the digital economy has dimensions that would weaken the state control. So things can begin to happen without the state control. And all of this is happening at a time when we are losing capacities and it looks like our country is fragile. So how can we make the best use of these opportunities on offer without privatizing and individualizing those things at the expense of the state? In other words, I'm saying that with digital economy, it's possible to produce many more millionaires that will be detached from the society and the community. Now, I confess that one of the most difficult subjects I've been trying to grapple with, like I did with mathematics in the secondary school days, is cryptocurrency. <laughs> I have never been able to understand it. <laughs> the more I am taught, the more confused I get. <laughs> You know, so I, I confess that, you know, so I, I hope that, you know, um, in the digital economy that we are building, that people would not only understand these issues, but also explain why and how we can partner with the state, you know, to make the best of this sense. I envision a Nigeria where leaders would begin from the people, where Contrary to what is now common language for us, you know, our leaders very rarely call us citizens. They say to our people. Um, and, and, and that itself is very telling. If you are not a citizen, you are a subject. We, we no longer want to be subjects. We want to be people who are taken, you know, seriously, who are engaged, and to whom the people who are going to govern us would come and say, what is the problem? We can tell them because we know. The existential matters, the things that confront us daily and seem to make us frustrated people because we cannot find answers to them, we will tell them so that together we can work. The kinds of leaders we are looking for are leaders who truly have light, who have understanding of our historical trajectories, leaders who understand the fragility of our social foundations, leaders who know that we are more united than divided, leaders who know that the ordinary people of our country 
need food security. They need basic infrastructure. They need to have a viable education system. Our universities need to be open. Our secondary schools and primary schools need to be strong. The levels of our out-of-school out of children will need to be drastically reduced. But most of all, it is us who would matter. My final point to you would be this. Don't think that anything is possible without struggle. We have embarked on that. We are not going to resign. There is not likely to be a revolution tomorrow, but there will be renewal. And that renewal would come from you as the anchor. Finally, we must restructure our federal system. The plurality, the, 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 the diversity of our leadership will tell us that with 36 states and 774 local government areas, we don't only have to look to the presidency for leadership. Our, our states must work. Our local governments must work. Nobody is saying they must all work at the same pace and at the same level. To every state, its ability. To every local government, its ability. But give us room to choose where we want to belong. Thank you. A well-deserving round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir.